Hi everyone, welcome back. Hopefully everyone found the networking tables to be enjoyable. Again, uh, there are multiple se networking sessions throughout the duration of our event today and tomorrow. So hopefully you'll make it to a table. Um, now we have a fireside chat on biotechnology and biosecurity, the future of defense modernization. Today we have Alexander Titus with the Advanced Research Regenerative Manufacturing Institute as our moderator, and Dr. Diane Deulis from the National Defense University. Diane and Titus, thank you again. Uh, looking forward to hearing this fireside chat, and I will let you guys kick us off. Great, thank you, Chrissy. And uh, I want to say thank you to everyone, Austin, Enrique. It was a great first first half hour conversation. And I also want to say thank you to the 100 people who are here. The fact that we have 100 people, um, the majority of which are not from the biotechnology and biosecurity community, is huge because this conversation is extremely important. Um, I one comment I wanted to make before we get into it, um, based on Enrique's comments, is that you know, this, the concept of offset and a lot of the examples he used were kind of offset weapons, um, but very clear as we have more and more conversations about biotech and biosecurity is this is very much not in the developing weapons standpoint. This is from a defensive standpoint, from an enabling technology standpoint. How do we empower our national security community, our health security community to be more effective at their jobs, uh, which is defending um, in, in all those capacities. So that's how that's the context we're thinking of for biotechnology and biosecurity. So my name is Alexander Titus. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Army, the Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute. Uh, I'll give a little bit more of a background about myself after Diane, but I'd like to introduce Dr. Diane Deulis uh, first. And Diane, can you give us a little bit of your background? Great, sure, I'd be happy to, Alex. Um, Alexander, it's good to see you. And I wanna say thanks to the organizers and everybody um, who's joined this session. So um, I think, you know, um, we, we all have a similar enjoyment of biology. How do we get into biology in the first place? Because um, we think biology is cool and we decided we wanted to study it and get degrees. And um, what most people ask me is, how did you wind up working in biosecurity when you started as a biologist? Um, I actually started as a biologist because um, I I really wanted to teach biology in secondary settings. And of course, after that, I went to the NIH and I became a program director. And I learned all about how the government funds research and supports R&D. And from there, I went to the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And that's where I really got into governance and policy for research writ large across the federal government. And I got a focus there on biosecurity. So um, after that, you know, your career sort of takes a tra trajectory into that security landscape. Even though you started as a pure biologist, you start thinking about security as part of your day job all the time. Um, so uh, I had a foray to preparedness and response at Health and Human Services. That was really interesting because it was all about responding to health emergencies like COVID-19. Um, and now I'm at, I'm at DOD. So interesting, I'm, uh, interestingly, I've, I've made this full circle because I work on biosecurity, biodefense, and emerging biotechnologies at DOD. But the other half of my job is teaching. Um, so I'm finally in a teaching job after 20 years, 25 years. Um, and uh, the teaching that I'm doing is teaching biotechnology to Department of Defense professional future leaders. Um, so it's part of their professional military education. For the first time, we're having people learn about biotech, which I think is kind of exciting. Um, so Titus, I'll pass it back to you um, and, and see sort of how did you get into this crazy um, biosecurity realm? Yeah, uh, on a side note as well, this platform's awesome. And for everyone watching, all the little claps make it very encouraging to have these conversations. I'm, so, I'm, I'm very excited. <laughs> I like that, whoever's doing that, thank you. There's a lot um, of smiley faces. So I come into the into the biotechnology and biosecurity world from, from the perspective of a technologist. So I spent the early part of my career in Silicon Valley, uh, the West Coast tech scene in enterprise software, and then eventually went to grad school and studied biomedical data science. So I was a, a you know, ML, AI ML applied to cancer. Um, as Austin has commented that the vast majority of, or a large portion of investments right now are in the cancer world. So of course I was drawn to study that. But as a grad student, um, 
studying these data science worlds. And so anyone who reads this report, one of the big areas uh, they call out is computational biology and, and the quantitative sciences. So there's a big draw and a big need there. And I started getting drawn into the national security space because you know most people who go into the life sciences uh, generally, it's some kind of healthcare slant because there's some kind of public service interest. Um, and so started getting into the national security space. And I had a very fortunate, uh, a mentor, and very fortunately, um, she called me and asked me to join the Department of Defense to help uh, stand up and lead biotechnology modernization for the DOD. Um, and so Enrique has mentioned this before, but biotech is now considered one of the top 10 technology priorities at the enterprise level for the DOD, which is phenomenal because for the first time ever, um, this is the case. And so I was fortunate to, to stand that up and then transition that to a phenomenal leader who is now continuing to lead that um, when I transitioned out of my role earlier this year. But for everyone, as we, as we set the context of, of our conversation, really what Diane and I represent is Diane has a great biosecurity background. I have a great biotechnology background, but there is not really a definitive line between those. It's kind of a, a spectrum, a continuum, if you will. Um, so for, for questions and ideas, um, feel free across the board to ask questions. We're going to try to answer them as we go. And ideally, if you have a question, we can answer them in the flow. You don't have to sit a, here and listen to us talk for 25 minutes before you ask a question. Um, I'll be trying to watch the live chat and see how that goes. Um, but really, the first question I want Diane and I to talk about, now Diane, in particular, your perspective, when you were at OSCP before, to the conversation now, um, technology, the biotechnology and biosecurity has changed dramatically. You know, it's an order of magnitude every decade, essentially, that's technology changes. So how has the conversation in the biosecurity world changed over, over the last 10 years or so? Yeah. Um it's really changed a lot. Um, when I first went to OSTP, so I, I could sort of talk about this in two categories, right? There's sort of the um, iterative advancements in biotechnology over time that have happened, sort of on the R&D, on the technology side. Um, and then there's the biosecurity piece that accompanies that, right? So um, when I was first at OSTP, I, I wore a couple of different hats there. And in terms of trying to generate support um, across the U.S. government for biotech, we were we were very much in a phase of let's build infrastructure, right? Let's build databases. Let's get people working in basic R&D to share their data sets, to put them in these public events publicly available repositories. Um, and at the same time, let's support some core pieces of biotechnology. Um, at that time, for example, we were supporting um, um, microbial forensics, right? We're in the in the post anthrax attacks era and people were very focused on those kinds of things. Um, we did a big project on aquaculture. How do we look across aquaculture and categorize everything that's there and and build this database and bring it to the public um, and for other researchers to use those kinds of things. Um, and so I see, saw them as kind of silos in that way, in that regard. Biosecurity, um, as I said, it was, you know, uh, a lot about post 911, post anthrax, and we used to call it the uh, gates, guns, and guards mentality, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the biggest thing you had to do was prevent bad guys from getting access to pathogens, right? So um, now let's sort of fast forward uh, a decade to now, and what are things like now? Well, now we've seen this explosion of genomic data with the ability to sequence um, DNA, to synthesize DNA, um, to edit DNA. So we see this data explosion um, and, the, and the data that's driving uh, biotechnology. But also we've seen a shift of emphasis, right, from maybe academic R&D to industry, private industry, startup companies, innovation in the private sector. Um, that's been a big shift. Um, and then this big convergence of digitization with biotechnology. So, so for me, those were two big changes that changes the landscape of the science. And paired with that, now you have to change the landscape of how you think about biosecurity. Um, it feels to me like um, 
that pathogen focus is really now a much much smaller category of things we need to be thinking about when we think about biosecurity. Um, and I, I don't know how much you were involved in sort of the Gates, Guns and Guards um, thinking, but I'm sure that you experienced that being part of the Intel community earlier on in your career as well. Yeah, well, I also, it's I like that Gates, Guns and Guards, because when I was at the DOD, I was always telling people that I'm trying to bring green goo to the zoom and boom people. Um, <laughs> and we, all, we all have our quippy ways of explaining the kind of mental model that the defense world, the security world has and how uh, what they perceive as this squishy field of life sciences and how that doesn't really reconcile with their mental model. But mm -hmm. I think right now with how biotechnology is, is changing, it really is starting to produce products that people understand um, and they can they can conceptualize because I mean biology just like chemistry if you're not an expert in the field It's kind of a faith-based science like I believe you when you tell me that it's doing something But I can't see it whereas like I can see uh, a vest or I can see a gun or I can see a vehicle like you can physically see those things um, You can't see biology in the same way at, mm -hmm. at, the, at the micro level but this advances in technology, which are starting to open it up and actually shift the paradigm of thinking away from, not away from, but expanding the paradigm of thinking where before it was just a security, a health security, a pathogen security, mm -hmm. to now it's bigger security considerations, but also that's this immense world of opportunity to leverage the technology to improve things and areas of emission areas that have nothing to do traditionally with biology. Mm -hmm. um, and I have some great examples to talk about how the DOD is doing that. But what I would really like to know from your perspective is what is like as this technology and as the field is changing, what are the things that you're most excited about it going forward with with these new developments? Yeah, I, I think in terms of DOD, well, there's a lot to be excited about sort of writ large um, across all of biotechnology. Um, and then specifically thinking about DOD, what, what is there to be excited about? Um, a couple of years ago, DOD started this program called um, um, Synthetic Biology for Military Environments. And they, they divided up, I, I think it was a great first start to get DOD's feet wet with synthetic biology and support um, projects that the DOD could be interested in. And they kind of divided them up into different categories, different areas of research. And I, I sort of agree with those, but I've I've sort of tweaked them a little bit in my own mind and how I think about it. So I, I think of things like tools, re uh, warfighter tools, um, which is sort of one category of things. I think about warfighter protections. And I think a lot of the force health protection and biodefense, um, you know, vaccines protection from um, biological weapons or pathogens or whatever is in this sort of protection category. And then there's this third category, which is like warfighter enhancement. So if we look at the tools, I'm thinking materials, sensors, um, cool kinds yeah. of coatings, um, things like that. That to me is most exciting right now because I, for two reasons. Um, one, because it could serve a lot of really, um, it, it, uh, it could serve the warfighter in many different ways, but it also could help solve problems that DOD is trying to solve. Um, there are some some biotechnology things that I think will will solve long standing DOD problems that have been intractable for maybe a long time. Um, and it's also closer to to prime time, right? So right. if you can get some of these cool materials and sensors, get them through the process to manufacturing and get them in, you know, deployed, then you've done a proof of principle for a lot of the other things that may be a little further down the road. I think some of the performance enhancement type things are interesting and have um, potentially cool applications, but I think you need to do the groundwork of some of this fundamental stuff first. And um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that actually um, as well. Well, we have very similar, uh, we're excited about very similar things. So for context, the reason that biotechnology has been made a modernization priority of the DOD is for exactly what you're talking about because of the expansion of what this can do and particularly 
you know, across health and chem bio defense, but also in military materiel. And so the examples that I have a couple for each of the services. So in, in earlier this year, I think June, uh, Cambium Biomaterials, a startup, announced a partnership with the Navy to develop uh, mit, uh, polymers that are, have better heat resistant properties. So you can coat the wings of airplanes to reduce uh, in flight uh, fires in airplanes. Mm -hmm. Um, the Air Force has partnered with a company called Biomason, small company called Biomason, mm -hmm. where they're developing, um, they have a, a microbial based concrete where they're trying to build growable runways. Um, and then the Army has invested a lot in their synthetic biology capabilities. The Army Research Lab down in Austin, Army ARL South, has their in house uh, synthetic biology expert doing a whole bunch of things across new materials to, to new antibody designs. Um, and then one of the things that, uh, you know, of course, kind of front and center right now, Moderna has worked with DARPA for a long time. Mm -hmm. And their mRNA-based vaccine is part of, right, our hopes for solving this pandemic, you know, one of one of many vaccine candidates. And just recently, um, DARPA announced, Moderna and DARPA announced another funding arrangement where they're trying to d develop Moderna's, Moderna's mRNA-based vaccine technology into field-forward small deployable um, on-demand vaccine production. And so the cool thing about biotechnology is that all of these technologies and these different application domains are being unlocked by the same kind of cross-cutting advances in science yeah. and technology, like CRISPR, computation, mm -hmm. all the things that go into synthetic biology. So the, I guess that's the thing I'm most excited about is like this is truly an unlock of an entirely new engineering discipline. Mm -hmm. um, that is making things possible. That is just wildly uh, yeah, unimaginable before. Super, super exciting. I'll just add two comments under what you've said um, as well, because I, I agree with all that. Um, and I think that in the past, we'd see these great things, particularly in some of the health areas that you were talking about. We'd see these great programs in DARPA where they're trying to you know, take that high risk and um, utilize these novel technologies in really innovative ways. And then, and then there'd be this, a little bit of a stall of how do we translate that into sort of usable biotechnologies that um, the DOD can really, can really utilize. And um, we're actually seeing that happen now in real time with, uh, you gave the example of the Moderna vaccine and things like that. Um, so I think that's really important. The other thing I wanted to add to it is um, since the since uh, DOD has begun this research and you gave great examples from the services, um, there has been an effort to tie biosecurity into um, a lot of these components. So for example, just this morning, um, I was on a conference call today with the folks from Wright Patterson who are doing the Biomason grant and trying to develop um, uh, the biological concrete. And part of my role invited to that, to that session is to sort of be one of the biosecurity advisors to that project. So in other words, not this is dangerous and we don't want to do it, but rather we want to have somebody on board who can help us with any risk mitigation that we need to do moving forward with this with this project for the Air Force. Um, so I think we've made big strides in how to do the research um, securely as well. Um, yeah, to Austin's point earlier about the guardrails of how to develop this technology um, within a responsible and secure mechanism. Um, but to, to tie all of the, the small companies and the startups and the, and the investor to how this is going forward, you know, a lot of the technologies that are being developed uh, for commercial applications, you know, my comment about how these are cross-cutting kind of unlocks for new technology enhancements, mm -hmm. you can, we can very quickly adapt these technologies that are developed in the private sector and in the commercial world where there are commercially viable applications to mm -hmm. new responses to health security and biosecurity issues. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about, you know, historically vaccines um, and uh, like antibiotics are not a particularly lucrative market. You know, it's mm -hmm. hard to make money in those spaces. So there's not a lot of effort, emphasis going into innovating there. But these new technologies uh, that you're using to create specialty chemicals or other application areas, those same technologies can then be, from a platform perspective, pivoted to help 
uh, develop. And so it helps de-risk when you yes. think about applying commercial technology to a potentially less than uh, less lucrative area, less uh, kind of return on your investments, that that platform application has big uh, has a big impact. Yeah, and then, and that has a big payoff, really. Yeah. I think, um, um, again, going back to the Moderna vaccine example, the manufacturing process that was stood up for that um, to get the vaccine ready in a much faster time period, a much compressed time period, um, effectively what they did was de-risk each of those um, platform developments for all the companies that were participating in vaccine development so that um, by taking away that risk, they could fully explore how to do this in the fastest way using, as you said, I like your phrase of unlocking, you know, these um, novel innovations in technology to do some, some cool things with these platforms. So hopefully a lot of what was learned through the development, through these vaccine developments for COVID is translatable to other kinds of things we want to develop. Um, you know, what are, what the lessons learned will be from the, from those projects, I think are going to help us a lot in translating to other um, biotechnology endeavors that DOD wants to do. Um, and it will give sort of proof of concept for companies as well, right? And give them better incentives to participate yeah. in DOD research. Um, one of the things that we've talked about in the past, um, it has been how can DOD partner better with um, sort of the startup community, the community that's driving innovation in this space, um, how can how can DOD partner better with, it, with them? And I know you have some ideas about that and you actually have some experience with that from uh, when you were working in the Pentagon. Yeah, so it, it, there's both the, the small, so we have lots of the works, the Softworks, the Afworks, the DIU, they're doing amazing things partnering with the startup community. But then for these technologies that are not quite ready to just transition directly in to, to an end user need. Um, I think uh, either, in, I think Enrique mentioned, or or Austin, I apologize for forgetting, but um, the Manufacturing USA network that the mm -hmm. DOD has sponsored uh, and funds nine manufacturing institutes in. So I'm the chief strategy officer at Army, the Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute, and our focus is to de-risk and unlock the kind of cross-cutting technologies to make regenerative manufacturing, the, re the manufacturing of replacement organs and tissues um, for, for long-term health and longevity, uh, an unlock for the United States. And so these public-private partnerships are a way to then have a community of partners partner in this relationship with the DOD. And so also, you know, just about six weeks ago, the DOD just announced Biomade, which is um, about 270 million total between the public and private investment in industrial biomanufacturing. So how do you take synthetic biology manufacturing, make it scalable, make it more cost effective for the entire US to make sure that we can unlock that kind of technology competition um, you know, here domestically, reshoring a lot of those manufacturing, new technologies, all that kind of stuff. So there's there are these kind of cool public-private partnership models, um, as well as many of the very popular and really successful um, works and DIU uh, models as well. Mm -hmm. Cool, so is there any questions? I haven't seen any questions yet, but we're happy to answer um, and talk ad nauseum about them if you <laughs> <laughs> so choose. So yeah, you can either type in the questions to the right or raise your hand and we can pass the mic to you so you can join us here on our virtual stage. Just make sure to obviously turn your turn your mic and camera on so we can see you. Oh, Nate Hughes, I'm going to hand the mic to you. Hey guys, thanks for the uh, really really insightful conversation. Um, I, you know, we had a lot of sort of cautionary experience in our in our world of um, AI and machine learning. You know, I'm not really well understood biases and machine learning algorithms. The sort of challenges of um, uh, software talent being willing to work with DoD, you know, the Google Maven example being sort of foremost here. This world seems even more ethically fraught. Um, are there good 
Is there some examples that, that you can think of that, that help manage that and create that? Um, you mentioned public-private partnerships, but it, it can help us navigate this next stage based on, on what we've learned with our, um, you know, the digital revolution. Yeah, Diane, you want to go thoughts first? Yeah, I mean, if, if I understand your um, question correctly, um, you're thinking about how do we how do we approach the sort of coming bio revolution in a way that's uh, ethical and secure. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, I would say that, um, you know, one of our goals to the extent we can do this is to build biosecurity and safety and sort of ethical frameworks in at the front end now while we have time. I mean, the community is racing forward so quickly and government moves so slowly um, that, you know, put, putting rigorous governance in takes a long time on the federal government side. And what seems to be a much better um, pathway is what I call biosecurity by design, having those um, public-private partnerships that discuss together how to build biosecurity as frameworks into the work that they're doing. Um, and some of this happens through best practices and some of this happens through ongoing forums where you can have those conversations. This is um, actually um, speaking again at one o'clock and I'm stealing my own thunder now because I'm gonna be talking about this in more detail at, at 1 p.m. Um, so stay tuned. But that's my short answer um, for that is is building building it in now um, and don't wait until bad things happen down the road and then you're reactive, which is exactly what we did in the traditional biosecurity community for probably 20 years. <laughs> um, and it, that's not a great approach. I would also Thank add you, that in the, in the field of AI, um, there wasn't already an established uh, community of AI security before AI really came into the limelight, uh, but biotechnology as it's developed, there's a very rich long-standing biosecurity community. Mm -hmm. um, and so as technologies develop, similar to Diane being on the call this morning, inviting the experts in the security aspect of doing this responsibly to, to the technology conversations, there's a huge community to tap on if you just do so. So we have a, a leg up in that regard. Uh, from that kind of robust body of knowledge already sitting there. Absolutely. Titus and Diane, we have so a, some other questions. I don't know, I, can you see them on the right? It's cool. You, yeah, you can so there's a couple of questions. <laughs> <laughs> there's a couple of questions about risk and the, the conversation and the way that Diane and I are using risk. And so de-risk in, in the context that we often use it in is making the technology mature enough that it becomes, it's, it's the valley of death conversation. So making mm -hmm. the technology mature enough that people want to take the chance on trying to commercialize it, where it's de-risked to the point where there's confidence that there will be a vi commercially viable solution at some point. Um, so investors could be drawn to it, startup founders will be drawn to it, and then they will provide some kind of value. Um, so it's both a technological risk and a financial risk. Mm -hmm. um, there's a policy question, Diane. How do we keep policy up to speed or dare say, get ahead of the technology development? <laughs> yeah, that's really hard. Um, and I think one of the most important things that the government can do in that regard is again, to publicly engage to the, it, to the maximum extent we, get, we can have listening sessions and listen to the public, listen to people in the companies, listen to people in the private sector. What frequently happens during, um, we call policy making um, in federal government sometimes, it's like you don't wanna see how the sausage gets made. It's like a lot of people internal to the US government who speak together regularly and we become an echo chamber of how are we gonna tweak this policy or tweak that policy when really we need to be constantly engaging with the outside so that we make policies that work for the outside, not just work within existing frameworks that we have in federal government. So, um, so 
I think we have better tools for doing that. One of the reasons that that's hard to do is not because people aren't willing in federal government, but we don't have a lot of good ways to do that. We can do these listening sessions. We can do, um, you know, public, people can write to the federal register announcements and say, and those are, they're kind of unwieldy ways. We need better ways to do that. Um, when I worked at OSTP during Obama, we actually had a blog site, which was like amazing that we had a blog site on public access and we allowed people in real time from the public to contribute to this chat session on a blog. And then we had all the comments right there and we could do them in a day and try and respond to them. So I'm hoping that we could do similar kinds of things like that. Um, for biotech moving forward, um, but um, I agree that it, that policymaking is slow, and we could do it a lot better. Well, Diane and Titus, thank you so much. Um, we are up on our time for this session, but no worries, everyone. We have another fifteen minute networking. So. Um, Hopefully Titus and Diane will be sitting at tables either one through six for the next 15 minutes. But if you don't catch them there, Diane and Titus are participating later in sessions today and tomorrow. So come uh, check out Diane later today, a couple sessions away and Titus tomorrow. And um, they will also be hopefully popping in and out and sitting at the round tables. One thing to remember too, before we head back into the lounge, please continue to chat and share any articles or interesting findings that you think anyone in the audience would like, along with posting anything on social media. Our hashtag is um, Offset Symposium 2020. Please tag, share, retweet, um, anything you know that you see here, to, here today. Um, we wanna keep the conversation going and we will see you all in the lounge. Thank, Thank you. you everyone. Thank you.